I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. He is Rod Schlerf, the FDA Markets Manager with ARX. With over 25 years of experience in electronic signatures for FDA-regulated markets, Rod has led ARX to be the largest supplier of digital signatures in the FDA-regulated industry. As a result, clinical operations organizations around the world are benefiting from reduced costs, faster operations, regulatory compliance, secure document exchange, and electronic submission to the FDA. With that, I will bring Rod's slides up. And Rod, I'll pass the presenter ball to you. Okay, well thank you Elizabeth, and thank you to all the participants taking an hour's worth of time this morning or this afternoon to participate in this webinar. As Elizabeth mentioned, I am the FDA Markets Manager for ARX and have been in this position for the past eight years. Today's presentation, I will be discussing the use of digital signatures throughout the clinical operations of FDA-regulated operations, and not specifically talking about our product, Cosine. So I'm going to try to keep the conversation vendor neutral. Just uh, a little background on my company, ARX, to kind of build the credibility of why I'm speaking today. The company, ARX, is the world's largest supplier of standard digital signatures, both the industry as well as government. In fact, our Cosine product is being used by more organizations today and all the alternative approaches combined, so we have a healthy market share. Specifically in the life sciences marketplace, it's estimated that uh, Cosine has about 90% of the market share, 90% of all the installations of digital signatures in the FDA-regulated markets are using our Cosine product. But as you can see, we compete in many other highly regulated and security-minded industries. Some of these industries, like the FDA, require digital signatures. Uh, for instance, certain states in the U.S., certain provinces in Canada require the use of digital signatures for engineering drawings. Both here in the U.S., at the, at the federal level and the, and the state local government level, as well as in the EU, in government applications, digital signatures are required. But in general, the markets we go after are either Require digital signatures are very much security-minded. Again, I mentioned about 90% market share in the life sciences industry. As you would expect, most of the major players are using our product, including nine of the top ten pharma, the majority of the leading CROs, and many of the cloud applications that are being hosted using our product. Today, about 20 to 30,000 different investigators, IRBs, labs, and CRAs are using our Cosign product. We also do business in government, government research, including the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, but also other governments around the world, and even non-research-based uh, government here in the U.S., including departments such as Department of Justice, Homeland Security, Energy, the Veterans uh, Administration, Department of Transportation, etc., as well as in Europe, recognized entities such as the Supreme Court of the Netherlands the ministry in Portugal, the Italian Senate, even the European Commission itself uses uses our Cosine product. We've changed the agenda a little bit today, so if you've attended one of our webinars in the past, we've tended to focus on the most common applications for digital signatures within GCP, mostly use of digital signatures in quality document management systems, the use by CRAs in signing trip reports when they visit sites, as well as within cloud applications. What well, we've changed this presentation today to really be more of a blueprint and guidelines in how you select and how you deploy digital signatures, regardless of the application where you plan on using the technology. So we'll talk a little bit more about the relevance of digital signatures in life sciences, and, uh, and really the, the heart of the conversation is on what are the major components and considerations in choosing and deploying a proper digital signature solution. So clearing the fog is what we're talking about here, and there's lots of different uh, areas where you may hear the term digital signatures. There's vendors out there, including us with our Cosign product. There's vendors out there that sell digital or electronic signatures, companies like DocuSign or EchoSign or VeriSign or qualified CAs in Europe, even self-signed certificates. And there's uses for digital signatures and some confusion about what the requirements are and areas like electronic submissions 
through the gateway to the FDA. What are quality management system vendors using, electronic or digital? What's proper to be used for electronic trial master files and signing of the regulatory packets? How do workflow vendors and document management vendors and eFlow vendors fit into this puzzle? And what are the compliance requirements as far as Part 11, GXP? How do you validate these systems? And what is ISO 32000 for PDFA? So hopefully we'll cover most of these items and clear some of the fog in the conversation today. First of all, I'll talk about why digital signatures. And in case you're not uh, familiar with digital signatures, digital signatures is a term that is used for a standard form of electronic signature. We'll talk about the standards bodies that, that publish and maintain these standards throughout this presentation. Before we get started, we'll take a look at what Information is available in a signed, a digitally signed electronic record. In this case, it's just a visible information that's contained in a PDF. So for every digital signature that's self-contained within a PDF, you will see visible information. And this information includes things like the name of the signer, the job title of the signer, perhaps the email address of the signer. The reason code, the reason for signing that was entered at the time of signing. The time date stamp when the signature was applied. The handwritten signature of the signer, so their John Hancock, is also included. And most of the major desktop applications, including PDFs, include indication of whether you should trust, not trust, or have questionable trust over the digital signatures and digital identities contained within that file. Now, digital signatures are active components of these electronic records. So if I click on any of the digital signatures, I start to see additional metadata about the signature details. This includes the three I's of digital signatures. First, the identity of the signer. So again, the name of the signer, the email address. I can click and see the digital certificate, the digital identity of the signer, how long this identity is valid for, what organization the signer is from, and why I'm trusting this digital identity. Again, more information about the intent, the reason code that was entered, the time date stamp when the signature was applied, and information about the integrity. So has the file been altered and changed since the signature was applied, and what are these changes? So these are the three eyes of digital signatures. And as you, as you can see, digital signatures are not just paper on glass. It's not just an electronic replacement for pen and paper. There's lots of security wrapped into adding a digital signature when you sign an electronic record. Um, again, we're not going to go over a demo today, but I just want to walk through a simple signing process to uh, set the expectations of how a document's signed. So in this case, an employee or anyone that needs to sign a document is sitting, sitting in front of a file. It could be an office file, PDF, a web form, InfoPath form, what have you. And they either have that file open on their local PC or they're accessing that file through a web application, through SharePoint, or through some other business application. Now, as a best practice, but also as a requirement for 21 CFR Part 11, the person needs to authenticate before they can find the file. And this is typically through, like, an Active Directory, LDAP, or whatever username and password has been uh, given to that individual to authenticate themselves before they can sign. And they're also asked to enter a reason code. Why am I signing this document? Once this takes place, then within a fraction of a second, a number of things happen in the background. The first thing that happens is that the document contents to be signed are calculated as what is known as a hash value, which is then securely sent to a secure signing environment, either a server or in the old days a smart card. Contained within this server is the three components that constitute the digital signature. First, this individual digital certificate or digital identity unique to that individual. There's also a unique signing key, a mathematical key that's going to be used to sign the document contents. And in most digital signature systems, there's also the ability to register a handwritten signature. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's their John Hancock and or maybe their corporate logo or maybe multiple graphical signatures such as their initials 
that they can choose to use every time they sign. Next, that document hash value, the contents are signed with the digital identity and the digital certificate. And all this information is then bound back to the file. Since most digital signature systems that employees, employees are using is integrated with the user directory structure of that organization, whether this be Active Directory or LDAP, these digital identities are what are, what are known as high assurance. There's a high assurance, a high level of confidence that the person signing is indeed someone who's been fully vetted by the organization from which that individual comes. However, there are other lower forms of digital identities and even non-digital signature systems where there's essentially no or a very low level of assurance of the identity of the signers. And obviously, you want to avoid these type of systems. Now, looking at the uh, signed document, someone who receives this document, 50 years from now, offline, can simply open up that digitally signed electronic record, and they can bridge trust with that signer and with that signer's organization. So this is not just by recipients that are employees of that same organization, but any outside party, whether it be business partners, vendors, courts of law, regulators in government, any auditor or contractors, Anyone accessing this file can perform this verification. And when you verify digitally signed electronic records, this verification is completely independent of the vendor who supplied the technology, the vendor themselves, the signer, even if that signer is no longer part of the organization or even no longer alive, as well as the signer's organization. So even if all these individuals and organizations are no longer in business, you can still perform this verification. So what you're doing with digital signatures embedded in electronic records is you're creating self-contained, portable, and sustainable documentation that's verifiable um, over time across geographies, across organization, regulators, and governments, and across technologies. So how is this trust established? How is someone receiving a signed document able to trust the signature of the signer and the signer's organization? Well, this is a core concept of digital signatures. And these relying parties only need to establish trust in the public root certificate, the public identity, if you will, of that signing organization. And this is usually performed through a one-time trust ceremony and then after that point, all signed documents from that organization received by my organization can be fully verified. Now, there's multiple trust models that are being used today. The most common trust model is what's known as controlled trust. And this goes back to this one-time ceremonial, one-time process. So there's a manual bridge on a case-by-case -case basis of who you want to trust and uh, how you want to trust these signatures from this organization. So again, I need to make a decision that I want to trust all signed documents from this organization, establish that trust, and then from that point forward, all the signatures will be verified when I receive them, or when my employees receive them. There are other trust models uh, that have been around for a while. Two most common web trust models are offered by Microsoft and Adobe. What Microsoft and Adobe do is once you install your digital signature system, you hand over this public ID, this public root certificate, to Microsoft or Adobe, and they publish it in their certificate store. This is not a universal solution in that Microsoft only uh, trusts signatures in Microsoft documents. Adobe only trusts documents in their PDF format. Hence, it's less common and not widely used today, but it is an interesting concept. There's other trust models. These are typically membership-based trust networks most commonly used over in Europe by third-party certificate authorities, but also you might see this somewhat in the U.S., particularly with large pharma that use these trust-based uh, or membership-based trust models like Safe Biopharma. But Safe in general is largely still just a conceptual idea, not widely used. Even some of the founding members are not using Safe today, so it's really not relevant to the conversation. Can next we'll talk about the use of digital signatures in life sciences? There's really three basic areas where digital signatures are relevant in life sciences. 
first area is being used by employees within any enterprise with within a government agency or department where you're looking for a consistent digital signature service to have your employees sign any document that requires a signature. On the other side here, we have SaaS services and clouds. So this could be a cloud service propped up as a private cloud by an enterprise, or it could be a SaaS vendor that has digital signatures embedded as their signature engine in their service. And the third area where digital signatures are relevant is with all the software vendors that are out there, the desktop authoring vendors, the document management and workflow vendors, they all simply need to support the digital signature standard to know that regardless of what digital signature system you're using within your enterprise and within your cloud, these systems will work with their software. A little more detail, again, for the relevance within an enterprise, a life sciences enterprise. From my experience in the marketplace, digital signatures are being used extensively throughout many enterprises in both GXP-regulated and non-regulated operations. Literally thousands of companies and enterprises today are using digital signatures throughout their operations. You may also note that the FDA does require the use of digital signatures in open systems. So any system as defined as an open system where outside parties need to re receive the signed documents or any organization that allows outside parties to sign documents, this is what an open system is. But there's also extensive use of digital signatures in closed systems, such as a quality management system. And there's uh, significant reasons why you'd want to use digital signatures in these closed systems. The applications within these enterprises where digital signatures are being used are throughout the enterprise, both within regulated, non-regulated departments such as HR, finance, legal, procurement, etc. but also the highly regulated stuff such as your core quality management system, electronic lab notebooks, manufacturing operations, clinical operations, etc. I mentioned digital signatures for cloud operations. Many, if not most, of the private cloud applications propped up by sponsors as well as public SaaS vendors are using digital signatures as their signature engine. And as these are open systems, they have to use digital signatures. As I mentioned before, tens of thousands of doctors, sites, IRBs, monitors, labs are using digital signatures that are embedded as part of these cloud applications. And these cloud applications that are using digital signatures, again, span a pretty wide spectrum. One of the more common applications today is within investigator portals where sites need to sign off on regulatory packets as part of the electronic trial master file. Another hot area is for patient reimbursement and assistance. So doctors and patients that are prescribed medications can sign off on reimbursements and assistance in affording those drugs. But it can also be non-regulated stuff. So many companies just want their business partners and their customers to sign off on various contracts and agreements. And as I mentioned, uh, digital signatures are very important to the desktop authoring vendors and to the other business system vendors. So many of these vendors today support digital signatures. And really, any e-forms, workflow, or document management vendor can easily integrate their technology with digital signatures, and many already have. So most of the common e-forms vendors already have an integration with digital signatures, Microsoft Office, InfoPath, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, PDFs, whether this be an Adobe PDF or another PDF vendor, XML, AutoCAD drawings, et cetera. Custom applications, particularly web applications, can have digital signatures easily integrated. And then many of the leading document management system vendors already have support for digital signatures. We happen to do a lot of work with the SharePoint. In fact, about half the projects we do today include integration with SharePoint. And integration, anyone with a web browser on a PC, Mac, or a mobile computing device can access and sign documents through this browser. Okay, now in the selection of digital signatures and deployment of digital signatures, I've boiled down the common things to think about in choosing a digital signature solution into five different categories. I call them the five Ds of selecting and deploying a proper digital signature. This includes compliance and who do we need to comply with, choice, how much choice should the vendor allow in the selection of the, the surrounding technologies, control, 
So how do you control the overall environment where digital signatures are being used? Cost effective. How cost effective are the various digital signature technologies? Decentralized. The new wave of digital signature products over the past five to ten years all use a centralized architecture, which greatly minimizes system administration as well as validation efforts associated with the deployment. So let's start with compliance. So the first area of compliance, obviously, is you need to comply with the digital signature standards. Now, here in the U.S., the main standards body is NIST, but these various organizations and governments that support digital signatures, and in some cases require digital signatures, all adhere and support to the same digital signature standard. So there's not multiple standards you have to concern yourself with. There's a single standard here in the U.S. that happens to be NIST. The first question you want to ask a vendor is, are you a digital signature vendor? These same standards are recognized and endorsed by other independent standards bodies. So, for instance, ISO with the EDFA standard, ISO 32000 incorporates the digital signature standard. OASIS, OASIS is the old PKI forum. They've developed a uh, digital signature standard for web services. So if you're going to do a web services integrated with an application, they include this standard, as well as these other standards bodies. So you can comply with the digital signature standards that are out there. Obviously, in the life sciences marketplace, we also have to comply with the FDA's requirements. Most people focus on the FDA's 21 CFR Part 11. I'm not going to get into all the different details where where Part 11 compliance is supported by digital signatures. I will call your attention, however, to paragraph 11.30 in controls for open systems, where they specifically call for the use of standard digital signatures. So any open system shall include procedures, controls, they include the, the appropriate use of uh, digital signature standards. Now, there is some confusion in the marketplace about the need to use digital signatures with submissions to the FDA. If you go to the FDA's website for the Electronic Submissions Gateway, there's a lot of great information here. And one thing you'll find out is that the FDA does not require digital signatures for signing of the common FDA forms, the 1571, the 356H itself. In fact, they don't care about the the supplementary signed documents associated with these submissions. The only thing the FDA requires when doing a submission across the gateway is that the transaction of the submission uses a digital certificate. And although they call this a digital signature, they really should be calling this an authentication-based digital identity. And they point you to the different ways that you can acquire an identity to support the submission, including creating your own self-signed certificate, which is fully acceptable. Now, at ARX, with our CoSign product, we do not promote CoSign for authenticating yourself for this electronic submission transaction. And that's because our perception is that what they're asking for breaks the basic rules and tenets of digital signatures in order to perform this, this simple e-submission. Regardless, this is a a very small fraction of the total use of digital signatures in the marketplace and is not something that's talking about signing of documents. And then people call the use of digital signatures the third wave of compliance with Part 11, and I agree with this. The first wave would be all the system remediation that took place before or just after the release of the original Part 11 in uh, March of 1997 where companies were remediating computer systems to comply with what they perceived to be the FDA requirements. However, right after Part 11 came out, all of a sudden the vendors like Documentum and OpenText came out with a different concept, and that is a huge secure repository of controlled documents that may or may not include electronic signatures. If they did include electronic signatures, it was just an electronic authentication and this authentication, along with the reason code and time date stamp, was secured separately from the document in the database of the repository. So not really a digital signature solution. Now, come around year 2000, J&J and Pfizer kind of led the third wave here, which has said, let's apply digital signatures directly to the documents independent of the repository 
so that we can extract documents out of the repository and share them with outside parties for full verification. Or if we want to migrate to a new document management or quality management system in some, sometime in the future, this migration is made easier because we've severed the tie between verification and access to the repository. The third area of compliance that uh, we talked about is compliance with the EU Directive on Electronic Signatures. Unlike eSign in the law around the use of electronic signatures in the U.S., the European Union is very specific on the requirements for digital signatures. In fact, for government applications in Europe, they only allow digital signatures. They give them different terms. They call them qualified electronic signatures or advanced electronic signatures. But in both cases, we're talking about the use of standard digital signatures. So if your organization is doing business in Europe, I would definitely take this in consideration, is that in Europe, you're going to find the requirement for digital signatures to be much more prevalent. And then the fourth area where there needs to be compliance is with the independent software vendors. So companies like Microsoft and Adobe have invested in making sure that their applications work with any standard digital signature solution. And they don't provide add-ons or connectors to proprietary-based electronic signature systems, as well as the standards bodies that support these other forms. I mentioned before the ISO 32000 standard for PDFA includes the digital signature standard. So that's compliance. The second is choice. And from our perspective, is the most successful digital signature deployments do not include the vendor providing an e-form solution, a workflow solution, or a document management solution. Instead, the deployments include the most robust and secure signature engine, so a solution that just provides a signing solution, and then allows the organization to choose their best-in-class, preferred, existing, or whatever future workflow, document management system, or e-form solution that they desire for their specific applications. So again, the, the recommendation is choose the best signature engine and then choose the best complementary technologies and easily integrate with the signature engine. When you integrate the signature engine with these complementary solutions, you're creating a machine. And these machines can be as complex or as simple as the application requires. The most simple machine is typically just a digital signature engine and then the desktop authoring tools. So whether it be Office documents, InfoPath PowerPoints, PDF documents, or other file formats, having just the signature engine and these documents is a simple machine and can be readily used upon installation of the digital signature solution. A more complex and comprehensive machine can be integration with some other enterprise business system. Most typically, this is a quality management system or an ERP system or a document management system. So leading vendors like Nextdocs, SharePoint, OpenText, Documentum, et cetera, or the workflow vendors like KDU and Nintex all support digital signatures and can be easily integrated. And then finally, you need to consider that any of these machines need to accommodate the modern worker that may not be sitting in front of a PC in the office, but instead may be working from a Mac or from a smartphone or from a, a tablet device. So these digital signature deployments need to work with all these computing technologies. So again, compliance and choice of the complementary technologies. The third is control. So from a control perspective, it's our philosophy that the end user organizations, the company that's using the digital signatures, need to, in fact must, have the freedom to choose their policies, procedures, methods, and technologies that they want to govern their business. So the vendor should not be forcing the organization to re-engineer or change the way they're governing their business. So the digital signature deployment, the digital signature system that you choose must adopt to your policies and procedures and not the other way around. So what are some of these policies, procedures, and enforcement technologies? Well, today, companies already have in place 
identity proofing strategies. This includes, includes your onboarding policies and procedures for how you bring a new employee into the organization through assigning of an I-9 or other forms. Add them to your network access and user directory structure, as well as for your customers and suppliers and how you screen them and prove who they are before you give them access to secure documentation, or in this case, allow them to sign documents. You already have these user provisioning and user management tools in-house today. The most common user directory structure happens to be Microsoft Active Directory, but there's other LDAP and user directory structures that can be easily integrated with digital signature systems to provide medium to high assurance digital identities and easy system administrative and user management functions. And you already have authentication methods today that you're using in-house, and you should continue to use these authentication strategies with your new digital signature system. As I mentioned before, the most common authentication strategy is username and password, most commonly Active Directory username and password. However, we have clients that prefer to have secondary factor authentication techniques, particularly in Europe or in certain high, highly sensitive applications where you may want to use one-time password devices, biometrics, or even PKI smart cards. Okay, so the fourth consideration is then cost effective. The good news is, is that the price for digital signature solutions have come down in price dramatically over the past decade. So the solutions are more affordable, and the time frame to achieve a nice ROI has been reduced. However, what needs to be considered is not just the price of the licenses, but the total cost of ownership of the, the deployment. And these total cost of ownership still vary quite dramatically from one vendor to the other, from one approach to the other. The article I'd like to point you to is a great article that was in the EIA version of Applied Clinical Trials way back about six years ago, where the article talks about the value of digital signatures in eClinical, but also includes a workup and analysis of what the costs are of various digital signature options and alternatives for a typical three-year deployment for a thousand users. And what this analysis looked at was server-based digital signature solutions and having to gather information from us about our, our co-signed products. Manage PKI services. So this would be someone like a VeriSign that used to have a service. Some of the qualified CAs that you might find in Europe, even someone like Safe Biopharma CAs. And then the third category was build your own. This is what Jane Jane Pfizer did way back when. And the yield of this analysis is that server-based solutions, the newer technologies, are typically 5 to 10% of the cost of building your own um, and roughly 20 to 25% of the cost of going to these third-party services. So the most cost-effective solution and strategy for deploying digital signatures is to, to deploy a server-based digital signature product that integrates with your existing Active Directory. And as I mentioned before, it's not just the price of the license or the digital certificates that make up this total cost. There's many other factors. Obviously, validation. What is the cost to validate these products and qualify the system? You should ask the vendor, how do you support this? Who is doing the validation? If we don't want to do the validation, do you have business partners that are experienced in validating your system? How does your system support Part 11? specifically around Microsoft Office signing. So Microsoft Office has some basic support for digital signatures. However, most people feel that it's not Part 11 compliant for various reasons. So how do you address that? For signing of PDFs, does the vendor require you to have licenses from Adobe or Adobe Acrobat for every user that's going to be signing with your system? What type of PDF viewers are supported? And can these PDF viewers properly interpret digital signatures. What's the cost and effort to integrate with various business applications, and how are these systems validated? Are there standard connectors to common business applications like, like SharePoint, or is this all part of a custom integration effort? Can the signing be performed from any machine, any computing device? 
or are you limited to just PCs? Or can we sign from Macs, smartphones, tablet, PCs, tablet devices? Are the licenses transferable? So if I have an employee that leaves the company, can I transfer that license at no cost to another employee? What if I have someone that loses their digital identity? Can I get another identity regenerated with adding additional cost? Are there restrictions in these licenses? Are there restrictions like this user can only sign a given number of times in a year, and then they have to pay more? These are questions you need to ask. How are these digital certificates, these digital identities generated? Where are they sourced? Can I source my own? How are they renewed, refreshed, and most importantly, re revoked? So if I have someone that I want to remove their signing capabilities, how quickly and how efficiently can I remove their signing capabilities? Eight, how are the users managed? And where are the associated system administrative costs? So am I manually managing each of these users or is through the integration with Active Directory or LDAP making my life easier so I can easily generate identities, remove identities, and renew identities on an annual basis? Nine, how long does it take to deploy the digital signature systems? Is it an on-demand service? So is it a SaaS service where I register and start signing? Well, if that's the case, is it a dedicated service? Or am I sharing the service with tens or hundreds of thousands of other companies. And then finally, do you offer just the core digital signature engine? And is this engine centralized? Or is it a, a distributed architecture? If it's a shared service, how robust is the service? Is there going to be a point when 10,000 companies are all using the same SaaS service and performance slows down or bogs down or is no longer available? So these are the 10 questions to ask of any vendor or any method that you plan on considering for digital signatures. And finally, is the architecture centralized? I mentioned way back when, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, digital signatures were largely de deployed on PKI smart cards that people physically carried around with themselves in order for them to authenticate and sign. Well, this is a, con a concept that's gone away. And most of the modern day digital signature systems are centralized servers. So if you look at a basic network, there's lots of boxes, lots of applications hanging off the network, one of which is the user directory structure, which is going to be integrated with the digital signature system that you deploy. So this digital signature system is just another box, another server that's hanging off the network as a single server or redundant servers. And these servers are going to generate, manage, and secure these digital identities the signing keys, the digital certificates or ID cards, and the graphical signatures of the signers. In order to use these digital identities, typically there's a software agent or a client that's distributed out to the local PCs on the network that tells that PC, anytime I want to sign a document, I simply use the server that's connected to the network. Many people today also use a virtual server, a VPN, terminal server, Citrix, et cetera. And so the digital signature system should be able to work in this configuration. So the agent is loaded to the server in any application software, but the actual PCs, Macs, and computing devices only have Citrix or terminal server access to the VPN server, and all signing is possible. And then from an integration with these business systems, there should be software loaded onto the business system servers themselves. But again, for the local machines where the signing is going to take place, there should be signing enabled only through a web browser with no local software on those smartphones, on those tablets, on those Macs, on those PCs. And finally, just looking at the vendor landscape, from our perspective, the typical vendors we see out there that are both digital and electronic signatures. I'll start with ourselves at ARX. We would put ourselves at the right end of the spectrum as far as adhering to the compliance, choice, control, and centralized architecture that I recommended. And we do have a large star. We do have a large market share in this space. So we are the 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room. I would also be fair and say that Cosign is in the middle of the road as far as cost and complexity. So it's high functionality at a fair price. 
Now, there are other pure digital signature solutions, including these qualified CAs, these third-party CAs, even Safe Biopharma certified CAs, which have, in some cases, similar functionality, in some cases, less functionality than Cosign, but usually at a higher price and not, not widely adopted. Now, on the left-hand side of the spectrum here is either no functioning digital signature solutions or non-digital signature solutions. The lowest form of electronic signature would be something like Adobe EchoSign, where there's no do digital identities. There's not even data integrity checks included with the signatures. One of the major uh, electronic signature SaaS vendors is DocuSign. And I put DocuSign further to the right here because my perception is that DocuSign, as they start to enter new markets, is going to start to include digital signature functionality along with the existing proprietary electronic signature capabilities that they have. So in summary, digital signatures are not just a replacement for paper and ink. All digitally signed electronic records contain these three I's, data integrity, signer identity, and signer intent. Trust of signed documents is an easy process, typically through a one-time trust ceremony between the recipients and the signing organization. Digital signatures are used extensively throughout the market today within enterprises and clouds. And in choosing a proper digital signature solution, you need to consider the five C's, which include compliance, choice, control, cost effectiveness, and centralized architecture. That's a wrap on my presentation today. If you want to speak to me directly, you can reach out to me at fda at arx.com. And we're now going to open the floor to questions, and we already see a bunch of questions from the audience. Yes, Rod, we have quite a few, and we'll do our best to get them all addressed before the end of the event. Should that not happen, I'll make sure that those questions are forwarded to Rod directly, and he can answer them through email. How do site personnel, such as investigators or coordinators, get their digital signatures? So that's a good question, and my guess is that the question is more around how do we identity-proof the investigators and the site personnel before they're given credentials to sign with? What we do at ARX is we usually recommend that you first benchmark what's happening today. What's happening today is that the regulatory packet or any document that site personnel need to sign is either FedExed as hard copy paper or emailed as an email attachment that's then printed out the paper. And then these personnel sign that those pieces of paper, and then FedEx or scan and email it back. And at no time in that process has anyone ever witnessed that individual sign those documents or check their identity to make sure that that handwritten signature properly represents that individual. Now, for site personnel, it's unique in that there's always going to be a CRA visiting that site at some time during site initiation. And part of the CA's responsibility can be closing the loop on that identity proofing by checking the identity of those individuals during the kickoff meeting. But even without doing that, you can force the site personnel to have to enter enough unique identifying information for them to either self-register themselves with the system, or you can have the CRA or the project manager go ahead and generate an identity for them to use based on the ongoing and previous conversation with those individuals. As far as how they sign, what we found is that a mandatory requirement for every investigator portal that we've worked on is that the signing needs to take place through a web browser. So you don't want to have the investigators have to download any client site software, only point them to a web application, a web portal, where they can go, see documents listed, and enter their username and password every time they want to sign. We have another question relative to security with these systems. How can you tell if it's the correct person or someone who is using your name? Could someone buy this software and create their own signature with your information? At the, at the most basic level where this might happen would be what's known as a self-signed certificate. So I can go ahead today from my PC and create a self-signed certificate create an identity that has a trust network of one, me. 
and I could claim that I'm Barack Obama. You can even make up a fake email address for Barack Obama, signed with this digital identity. Now, anyone receiving this document, when they click on the active digital certificate, they're going to see that there is no trust network, and no organization from where this certificate came from. It immediately identified that this is a self-signed certificate. On the other hand, a proper digital certificate used for signing has this full trust network as part of the metadata self-contained within the digital signature in the signed document. And typically, this includes two or three levels that I can verify. The individual, the individual's organization, and in some cases, a third party that touches for both the individual and the individual's organization. All right. And we have a question specific to your slides. What does the size of each decagon represent? In, in the chart where I tried to show some of the vendors, the size of the star was the relative market share associated with each vendor. For instance, the largest stars were ARX Cosine as a digital signature vendor in life sciences. The second largest star was DocuSign, which is an electronic signature vendor. It also supports life sciences, although they don't support FDA-regulated operations. It's, uh, it's just a, a popular application for signing of contracts and agreements. And a question about differences. What is the difference between digital signature and digital identity? Digital identity, I'll, I'll kick this up a level. All digital signatures and all the terminology I use today comes from a, a, a core concept, a core set of standards known as PKI, public key cryptography. You don't need to know what this is, but it's a set of standards using cryptographic algorithms to perform one of three things. Digital signatures, authentication, or encryption. What I'm talking about today is the use of PKI or digital certificates for digital signatures. In the PKI world, you never use the same digital identity, digital certificate, for more than one function. So if I wanted to use the same technology for authentication, I may generate a digital identity for someone to authenticate with. Or if I want to encrypt something, I may generate a digital identity for that person to encrypt with but you never use the same digital certificate, digital identity, to perform more than one of these functions. So with digital signatures, there is a, an embedded identity with the, each signature known as the, the digital certificate, and it has one purpose for digital signing. All right, and here's a person with a little bit different problem for you to address. What happens when I need to apply a digital signature with a centralized system and I'm not currently online or have Internet access, for example, in some countries overseas. What happens when that centralized service can't be reached? Right. And, and this is a question that's come up. It came up before even centralized or online-only services. In the old smart card world, people would need to swipe their card physically, and they could do this offline, although they would need a smart card reader, which isn't always the easiest thing. What I can comment on is in the eight years I've been involved with ARX, we've seen the availability of Internet access to be much more prevalent. In fact, we have clients that do research out in little villages in Africa doing AIDS research. And although Internet access isn't available via Internet service provider, these people own themselves with phones that can get access and get them online to sign with. But also, vendors in general have a fail-safe, for instance, at ARX. We also have a version that, that can be used locally on an individual machine in an offline mode. Sounds like an excellent solution. Does the FDA have a list of e-signature software that they approve, or is there an easy way to tell software meets regulations by the FDA? No, they don't. So under the Electronic Submissions Gateway, I mentioned that for authentication purposes of the transactions of a submittal, they, they give you a few suggestions. But for, for the bulk of signing within an enterprise, the FDA doesn't, doesn't have a list of vendors. What, what I will say is that they would never, even if they could, they would never have a list of 21 CFR Part 11 compliant or validated products. There's really no such thing. Compliance, Part 11 compliance in particular, is not just about the product. It's about the product and the way you install and use and maintain that product. So it's, uh, it's process, procedure, 
uh, documentation showing that you're adhering to those, those policies and procedure um, wrapped around the technology, and that's what get you, gets you compliance. So the best example I always come up with is that with our product, it can be used in, a, in an FDA-compliant manner. But if you choose to allow all of your employees to have the password 12345678, it's a system that's very easily hackable and breakable, and no one would find that a reasonable approach nor a Part 11 compliant approach. Okay, and a question that gets down to the real nitty-gritty. What is the typical return on investment or payback period associated with digital signatures? Yeah, so I didn't address uh, much of this during my presentation, whereas in the past I have, and that's because I think the market in general understands and appreciates more the value of, of digital signatures and, and completing the automation and the investments in the surrounding technologies. We do have some benchmarks, though, from our clients, the typical payback period is six months, but it depends on the application. We've had clients that have gotten a payback period in 45 days. But again, it, it depends on the business process. One of the more extensive processes is, is clinical research associates working for CROs signing trip reports. And uh, with these trip reports, every trip report they FedEx back to the home office for a second signature that FedEx off to the sponsor. So some of these large CROs were spending half a million, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars annually just in FedEx. So obviously there's a very quick payback for applications like this. The other area where there's, there's uh, benefit is just in the overall speed. Site initiation. You need these regulatory packets signed by the investigators. And if there's a bottleneck in getting the signatures from the site personnel, it could delay the study startup for a few days, weeks, months just because you don't have these signed documents. Excellent and perfect timing. I see we've come up on the 2 o'clock hour. Rod, I want to thank you so much for your presentation and all of your colleagues there at ARX. To our attendees, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and learn about this technology and its use in the field. And I do hope, on behalf of BioIT World and ARX, that we'll see you at future Global Web Symposia. With that, I'll sign off and say, have a great day. Bye-bye.